Good afternoon, and um, we are very happy to welcome our most accomplished speaker to take our CME on diabetes today. Uh, Dr. Nihal Thomas is accomplished on many domains. He is, of course, professor and head of endocrinology unit one in CMC. He is, has won CMC's award for the outstanding researcher with over 65 research projects, randomized trials and diabetes alone, 270 index publications. Some on the, on the way, he managed to train 200 uh, staff from 200 hospitals in diabetes management, got the Royal College of Physicians Award for the best department in education. Their department was awarded the BMJ's Diabetology Team of the Year. And along with all this clinical education and research, Dr. Nihal has been Deputy Medical Superintendent at CMC, the Vice Principal for Research, and the Associate Director for Chittur, in each of which areas he has left lasting contributions. So uh, we welcome Dr. Nihal, and thank you for making the time for this important CME, sir. Thank you, Rina, for those uh, kind words. And um, without much ado, I will start my talk. And yeah, I hope my slides are visible. Uh, essentially, I'll be talking about management of uh, diabetes mellitus, utilizing oral anti-diabetic agents. Uh, I shall focus across the spectrum of oral anti-diabetic agents per se. But I will also discuss a few patients uh, and their management uh, in between. So nothing is more deceptive than an obvious fact. And this is what um, Arthur Conan Doyle said in connection with a particular case he was trying to figure out. And I think treating type 2 diabetes is still something, a bit of a, a problem, a bit of an uh, enigma in spite of the huge menu of oral anti-diabetic agents that we have over here at this point of time. If beta cell dysfunction, insulin resistance and hepatic glucose output can cause diabetes, then why is treating type 2 diabetes so complex? Why is it such, such a huge problem? So essentially, when we talk about diabetes pathophysiology, the traditional triad to the ominous octet, we have the traditional triad of, of hepatic glucose production, insulin secretion, and When we talk about the basic physiology of diabetes, we have the traditional triad. We talk about hepatic glucose output, a reduction of insulin secretion from the beta cells, and peripheral resistance. Having said that, now we know that there are several issues involved in type 2 diabetes. We have not only that, besides a reduction of insulin secretion and peripheral resistance, but we also have other potential targets. And each of these targets, these eight targets, have a specific medication that can be given. So the menu that we have is extensively large. When I was a medical student, perhaps about three decades ago, the number of oral anti-diabetic agents which are available in the market were only about five. We had libentlamide, we had lipizide, which had just come in, we had metformin, we had fenformin, and we had clopropamide. Besides that, when we reached a particular point of time in the early 1980s, the American Diabetes Association and the Food and Drug Administration of the United States had actually banned metformin for a period of time. And so the number of medications which were available from a scientific perspective were extremely limited. Now, if you look at this particular menu, we have almost 
eight different groups of medications which are available in the market and totally more than 24 medications and there are more to come. So how do we choose from these medications as to what is the most appropriate medication to use in treating type 2 diabetes? Let me start by saying that this lecture will focus entirely on oral anti-diabetic treatment. It will not cover insulin and the GLP-1 injectable therapy, which shall be covered a little later on. Glucose monitoring practices and devices, which are also now part and parcel of treatment of diabetes, will not be covered. Diet and diabetes and gestational diabetes. And I'm certain that these topics will be covered in the next three months uh, at some point of time. So what I'll be covering is the spectrum of oral anti-diabetic agents and the international guidelines, which are available where the traditional old timers for treating type 2 diabetes, metformin and sulfonylureas, how do they help in today's world? The medications called the thiazolidine dindones, which essentially is pyoglitazone. There has been a stigmata. And how do we eradicate that from our thoughts? Gliptins, they are essentially now very important in treating diabetes. What are the glynides, the alpha glucosidase inhibitors, and the new group of medications which target the kidney and reduce the, uh, increase the amount of glucose that is excreted from the kidney, and then a few other bits on antimalarials and the dopamine agonists. So we'll come to the NICE guidelines, which are the British guidelines for looking at treating type 2 diabetes. We have the American Diabetes Association, and we also have an Indian group of guidelines. But I would like to say that these are rather pragmatic in all guidelines, diet and exercise are foundational for the management of treatment of type 2 diabetes. Metformin is pivotal thereafter, after using diet and exercise. And then we should decide as to what should be added on next. If you look at the NICE guidelines, we have metformin, which is being used. But thereafter, we have a choice of multiple medications which can be added on. And if you look at the list carefully at the left hand side, we can see that the first medication which should ideally be added on and provided the patient can afford it would be DPP4 inhibitors. And then we talk about pyoglitazone, which is very much over there, the sulfonylureas, and finally the STLT2 inhibitor. So, in matter of choice, the second medication which can be used are any of these particular medications in that particular order. We have then the phase of second intensification after adding the second medication, the third medication. And the third medication would therefore be in any of these medications. Once again, after adding on a DPP-4, the next drug would be a pyoglitazone or an sulfonylurea or an STLT2 inhibitor. Now, the question is, after having three medications, you may have a patient occasionally who would ideally require insulin therapy. But we have several situations in India wherein either the ability to use a syringe or a needle, learn how to take insulin, or the presence of an educational system to ensure that the patient takes insulin is in fact absent. And in certain situations, in spite of the best education, a patient may have insulin syringe or needle phobia and may not want to take insulin. So can we use a fourth medication in that situation? Now, there is Korean literature which talks very clearly and says that after the third intensification, you can have a fourth phase of intensification, wherein if in case a patient refuses to take insulin, you can add on a fourth medication in addition. So here in the algorithm, we have metformin, sulfonylureas, dipeptidyl peptidase inhibitors, and STLT2 inhibitors. And an alternative is utilizing this form in addition, metformin, sulfonylureas, STLT2 inhibitors, and pyoglitazone. Having said that, one should always understand when we use this number of medications, and especially in a patient who has crossed the age of 60 or 70, they may have other comorbidities like ischemic heart disease, lipid anomalies, and the vast number of medications that they are using can often lead to medication error. Very often patients tend to skip their medications. They may not tolerate such a huge number. They may feel absolutely nauseated. Or in addition to that, they may have drug interactions, which may also occur. So at this point of time, 
it is always prudent to advise your patient that after the addition of the third oral antidiabetic agent, ideally speaking, insulin or an injectable formulation would be the best thing to use and would invariably control sugars if all the rules are followed properly. Algorithms and guidelines are convenient, but we use a lot of individualization when we use oral antidiabetic treatment for treating our patients with type 2 diabetes. So what is the role of an oral, ideal oral antidiabetic agent? Number one, we would like to delay the subsequent use of insulin, conserve beta cell function, improve patient compliance. A once daily dosing of a medication is always appropriate and ideal. Reduce any adverse effects. And the commonest adverse effect that we face, which is iatrogenic, is hypoglycemia. So we would like to prevent hypoglycemia and ensure that we do not use injectable agents. So this is our ideal situation we should try to adhere to. So I shall start first with the first and foremost medication, which is after three decades of time-tested usage, we know that metformin, or perhaps six decades of time-tested usage, that metformin is the ideal drug. I think there are still questions about uh, metformin and its adverse effects. And it all arises from the 1970s, where metformin was banned by the American Diabetes Association and the FDA in the United States of America because of perceived lactic acidosis. And for 15 years, the American world did not use it. Europe continued to use it. India, with ambiguity, used it at some times and at some points of time, depending on individual winds and fancies, did not use metformin. But it was proven by the 1990s, after 15 years of being banned by the FDA, that metformin very rarely ever caused lactic acidosis. It was more the sister drug, fenformin, which had a greater put, put penetration into the mitochondria and was more soluble in lipid that it would cause lactic acidosis. Metformin rarely ever causes it. It can happen only in significant renal failure, hepatic failure, wherein lactate production can be increased, or in patients wherein peripheral perfusion is reduced, that is circulatory shock. And these are the situations where we should not utilize metformin. So the American Diabetes Association and the European guidelines say that it is a primary drug of choice for treatment of type 2 diabetes. It should be always given after meals. And the reason is because the bioavailability is increased 30% when you give it after meals. It's not so much about preventing gastritis. It is more about the bioavailability. It, can be in, it should be increased eventually, but do it gradually. Because you give the big dose of, say, one gram twice a day straight away, invariably gastritis can occur in about 60 to 70 percent mild diarrhea is reported in about 10 percent initially but this disappears in a large number and persistent loose stools are present in about five percent and withdrawing the drug is required only in about two percent of those who take metformin in the initial phase the maximum dose ideally would be 850 milligrams thrice a day but we do go up to one gram thrice a day in india because the 850 milligram uh, formulation is not easily available, and that's quite safe. It's also important to remember that metformin has, in its sustained release forms, which is, of course, better. the area under the curve of control of glucose is so much better. The sustained release form may, in some formulations, have a shell and an active principle inside. And the shell is very often excreted in the stool, and this causes apprehension among some of our patients when they see it and they wonder whether the medication is working. So they need to be repeatedly reassured. And if they are not, then you may have to just switch to the regular formulation rather than the sustained release formation, formulation. Now, you need caution only with metformin only in these situations. You have an underlying malabsorption or chronic gastrointestinal disturbance. Be judicious and probably not utilize it. Remember that in acute hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes, patients may have a transient dysautonomia. And they may have a bloated stomach and feel very gaseous. In those situations, metformin is not contraindicated. In fact, if you control the glucose well, these symptoms actually disappear. Now, organ failure of all sorts. A GFR less than 30 ml per minute, metformin is contraindicated. And this has been stretched up to a creatinine of around 1.8, uh, which was published 
uh, very elegantly in an article about four years ago in diabetes care. You can give metformin in chronic liver disease, provided there is no encephalopathy, the albumin levels are good. So basically, in situations where there is no child C disease, you can give metformin. But it is contraindicated in acute hepatic necrosis and or epi, acute hepatitis. In cardiac failure, provided there is no hypotension and the cardiac failure is adequately compensated, the patient is on adequate ACE inhibitors, ARBs, low doses of diuretics, you can still give metformin. It is only in decompensated cardiac failure that metformin is contraindicated. What about B12 deficiency? Metformin can actually induce B12 deficiency in about 1 to 2% of the population. And this is more common in vegetarians. So is metformin contraindicated when you develop B12 deficiency? The fact is, if you have significant B12 deficiency, which needs injectable treatment, you can actually continue the injectable treatment and give metformin. And so you have to actually play it measure by measure. If you have, when do you suspect this problem? Do you routinely check B12 in everyone who's on metformin? And the answer is no. The answer is, if in case you suspect in patients who are developing unexplained macrocytosis or anemia, or if in case peripheral neuropathy is out of proportion to the diabetes control, then you would think of one of the possibilities as being B, vitamin B12 deficiency. Should routine B12 therapy uh, be combined with metformin, therefore, orally? Well, there is no such guideline to suggest that is required. And if you follow that aspect, well, perhaps not. Sustained release forms, as I have mentioned, are definitely much more effective because of the area under the curve. And nowadays, in CMC Velo, we tend to utilize the sustained release forms as a matter of practice over the short acting forms. There are some patients who do not like the sustained release forms because the tablets are very large and have, they have difficulty swallowing it. Therefore, you would like to use the regular formulations. So here is a clinical problem. 43-year-old gentleman came with tiredness, presented with glucose levels, fasting of 180, postprandial of 280, A1C of 8.9% uh, is overweight, as you can see over here, weight of 78 kilograms and height of 125. Started on exercise and diet for two weeks, and his glucose levels were still elevated. Uh, we think he achieved optimal levels of exercise. Now, they say you can go on for longer, maybe even after two months. But he said that it would not be possible and he had to pursue his regular work. So we had to be practical and we started on metformin 500 MG twice a day. Within two months, his A1C levels were under good control and the fasting and postprandial glucose levels had also dropped to adequate levels. So I'll switch next from metformin to sulfonylurea, and I'm certain there will be many questions which you can insert into the chat box, and Dr. Rina will actually ask me these questions towards the end of the talk. Sulfonylureas, and in fact, I should now highlight the fact is that whenever a new agent comes into the market, the pharmaceutical industry has a habit of poo-pooing the old medications because they want their formulation to be pushed ahead forward, and we always need to realize this. There's a lot of literature which comes out with new medications. And the old medications are kind of sidelined. The price of the old medications drops, and it becomes unprofitable for major pharmaceutical companies, and they want to knock them off. But I sincerely this hope this never happens to sulfonylureas, yeah, at least in the, in the near future, because they are still the most potent medications in the armamentarium. Glimentlamide and glimipride are the most powerful drugs if you want to reduce glucose levels when you start these medications. Glycoside and glimipiride, uh, in spite of, in, in fact, in fact, glycoside long-acting formulation and glimipiride, which is in, intrinsically long-acting, uh, do not cause much uh, hypoglycemia because they have a peripheral action. Glimipiride, in particular, stimulates the GLUT4 receptors, the glucose transporter receptors on tissue, and therefore is not, the glucose reduction is not entirely insulin dependent. Therefore, glimipiride is less likely to cause hypoglycemia than glimipiride. Repeat, it's not that it does not cause hypoglycemia, but it is less likely to cause hypoglycemia uh, when we utilize it. So it is still, sulfonylureas are still the second line add-on drug after metformin in those who cannot afford DPP-4 inhibitors 
or uh, for that matter, the new SGLT2 inhibitors as well. So we should always know our maximal doses for utilize of any medication. We should also realize that particularly with sulfonylureas, that two thirds or three fourths maximal dose gives the best effect. And unless you're really pushed uh, or if the patient is refusing the next line of treatment, you don't usually go to the maximal dose of, pre of, of sulfonylurea. So you can see over here, glibenclomide from 2.5 mg twice a day right up to 10 mg. Uh, as you grow older, it's very important to remember, once you cross the age of 60, you will find invariably that the requirement for sulfonylurea starts dropping. Month by month, year by year, you will find that a large number of patients with sulfonylurea start getting hypoglycemia and the A1C levels start dropping. So you should progressively reduce the sulfonylurea dosing and some patients may not tolerate libentlamide or even glimipride in certain situations and get frequent hypoglycemia. So you may have to consider replacing the medications with an alternative, which I shall talk about uh, as, 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 as we go on. So you look at the maximal creatinine doses over here as well. It's important to pay heed to this and not utilize sulfonylureas beyond these creatinine cutoffs. So I have mentioned about uh, glimipride and glycoside, the extended release forms. Single daily dosing is ideal, can be used in 40 to 60 percent, but the single daily dosing does not work in all patients. So very often we give the higher dose of glimipride in morning, say something like 4 mg or 5 mg, and maybe 1 or 2 mg at night. But once again, as you become more senior, across the age of 60 or 65, it's better to omit the night dose of sulfonylureas because nocturnal hypoglycemia can be a, a problem. Not only can it be a problem, it can be quite threatening at times. Anyone on sulfonylureas has to follow a similar dietary regimen which they follow for when they take insulin. This is the mantra of three meals and three snacks. It's very important that the bedtime snack should they be taken, otherwise hypoglycemia can occur and it can be silent and can in fact cause arrhythmias and in a small proportion can be life-threatening. So dimipride, once again, because of its peripheral action, is safer to use in those who are physically active. Here is a 49-year lady with type 2 diabetes on metformin one gram twice a day. Her four-point profile, as you can see over here, is elevated and the A1C is 9.2. Uh, has been very compliant with diet and exercise. So we start off on glimipride 2 mg once a day and the glucose levels have come down. Uh, dosage is increased uh, then to 2 mg in the morning and 1 mg at dinner. And we can see we have achieved satisfactory control. Now, hypothetically, you might find patients who come to you initially where the glucose levels are very high. The fastings are, say, something like 250 or 300 when you start with and 500 uh, postprandially. So what do you do over there? Uh, ketones are negative. You're certain this is type 2 diabetes. Uh, what would you do in this situation? Do you need to start insulin? The answer is you can try out metformin and glimipride in combination. And start off with metformin 500 twice a day and then add, and at the same time induce the glimipride at the same time in addition. Now there is one important thought over here and this is a, a concept called glucotoxicity. So when you have uh, very high glucose levels, the existing beta cell function can be diminished. In early type 2 diabetes, there is some beta cell function in the beginning. The C-peptides are elevated. The insulin levels also, when we check them, can be uh, elevated. So glucotoxicity can occur and it can be shut down more than what is expected. And if you give a small dose of insulin in the initial phase for about a week or two weeks, the beta cell function can actually improve. But the question here is how many of your patients are going to accept this as a routine? So I don't push this onto our patients. It is an option. Sometimes patients may in fact get worried and suspicious and think that the doctor is going to force them to take insulin at this point of time. And it's going to be a lifelong kind of drudgery that they have to go through. So it's important to remember this, that you can salvage some beta cell function by starting insulin in the first couple of weeks or three, two, three weeks and bring the sugars down. And then the amount of oral antidiabetic agent dosing can be less, but you cannot enforce this on all your patients. We go next to the thiazolidine dions uh, and 
these have had a rather checkered history. I do remember way back in the 1990s uh, when my teacher and me were going through our journal club, when this wonderful article came out in the New England Journal of Medicine of a group of medications which would reduce the, reduce the glucose levels and also cause a reduction in diastolic blood pressure. What a wonderful medication which could target both glucose as well as reduce blood pressure at the same time. And of course, that effect has largely been forgotten that it does have some effect on the vascular endothelium and in fact might reduce blood pressure. Troglitazone was the first drug which came into the market and was very popular across the United States and Europe. Before it came to India, unfortunately, what happened, a few patients developed hepatitis. Some went in for hepatic necrosis, some died and some needed liver transplantation. And of course, the drug authorities came down very heavily and banned the drug. It never came back. It was unfortunate because on reanalyzing the data, it was found that this was found in a very small number of patients. And also this happened largely in those who were alcoholic, or, uh, who, were, uh, uh, who were dependent on alcohol. It did not happen in, in, other, in other people. But that was the end of troglitazone. And then came rosiglitazone and pyoglitazone. They came in very fast from the Indian market in the early 2000s. Wonderful medications. We started using them regularly. We added them on to metformin and sulfonylureas. And we were, in fact, able to take off some of the patients who were on, on sulfonylureas and manage them exclusively with metformin and pyoglitazone or rosiglitazone. By the middle of the 2000s, it was noticed that there was a subset of patients who went into uh, volume overload and cardiac failure. And then came this study called the record study, which was published in uh, around 2008. And it showed that there was an abnormal number of adverse cardiac events. With that, rosiglitazone got banned. But it's interesting to note that when reassessment of the data of rosiglitazone was done in 2012, the FDA said this is not true. And this is only once again on a small proportion. But the medication got a bad name. And the other drugs in that class, like pyoglitazone, also got a bad name. And people started using them less and less. So what is the truth about thiazolidine duels? They are useful medications, and they should be used. Let me start. And only pyoglitazone is available right now on the market. They are generally safe, number one. But remember, they can cause weight gain. And if you have an already obese patient, it can add to that. So higher doses, more than 30 milligrams, 45, are more likely to cause this weight gain. Edema is common. About 20 to 30 percent develop mild pedal edema. In some, it can be gross, but this is not associated with a cardiac dysfunction uh, or volume overload. It can worsen osteoporosis in a subset. So food for thought, if you have a postmenopausal woman who has severe osteoporosis or has had fractures, would you give pyoglitazone? The guidelines don't say don't give it, but I would say possibly avoid it if you have other alternatives. It's definitely contraindicated in Graves ophthalmopathy, can worsen uh, the proptosis by increasing the amount of tissue in the orbit and the muscle uh, might also, in fact, become more thickened with this. Macular edema can also be worsened. So if you have someone who has severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, even without macular edema, don't give pyoglitazone. If you have macular edema, or if you have proliferative change, definitely do not give uh, pyoglitazone. Now this occasional fluid overload is a concern and therefore, even though the ADA says you can give it in class one and class two of ischemic heart disease, I would, I personally don't give it in patients who have active ischemic heart disease. If they have already had their uh, stents and they've had their uh, bypass surgery done, and if there's no alternative, yes, I wouldn't mind giving it. But otherwise, I generally, we generally do not utilize it in patients who have active ischemic heart disease. And remember, above the age of 60, ischemic heart disease is common. It might occur in about 20% of patients who have diabetes. It may be silent. Osteoporosis is common in my menopausal women above the age of 60. And so pyoglitazone, once again, would come lower down on your list for utilization as a drug of choice above that age. It's not contraindicated. It is still useful. What about bladder cancer? This is the other thing about pyoglitazone. And it's very interesting because at the same time uh, when this adverse effect was highlighted, 
another group of medications came into the market, the GLP-1 analogs, the drugs like liraglutide. And it once again was a pharma lobby in part, where they tried to actually put, put these medications out of the market and highlighted negative aspects about it. But the truth, once again, over here is, it is uncommon. It's something like 1 in 14,000 patients can develop bladder cancer, and whether it is even due to the medication, it's an association. So it is not a common occurrence. And therefore, yes, certainly somebody with a previous urothelial malignancy, you would not utilize it. But continuous exposure, even up to nine years, shows that is an extremely rare occurrence. All right. So it is important. It's a potential second line medication in lean patients. In India, when pioglitazone first came into the market, uh, this patent rule, which the United States uh, and uh, which enforced upon India in the early 2000s was not being followed. And pioglitazone came at a very low price. So many generics were there in the market. And so it continues to be one of the cheaper medications in the market. It is an important third line medication in those who cannot afford DPP-4 inhibitors. So a 41 year old farmer with an income of 25,000 rupees per month, lives with his wife and one child who's 15 years old, has type two diabetes initially on diet and plenty of exercise, BMI is 22. Uh, remember the Indian cutoff for being overweight is a BMI more than 23. And so this gentleman has perhaps got something what we would classify as somewhere in the optimal BMI. And on metformin one gram twice a day with lipitlamide 7.5 mg twice a day. The fasting glucose levels were 170, postprandials are high. Choice, this gentleman, I started him on pioglitazone 30 milligrams. Three days later, the glucose levels have not moved much. Remember, pioglitazone takes time to work. It works at the adipocyte level and through methods of transcription, this effect can take quite long. So the best effects may be seen after about six weeks of using pioglitazone. So be patient when you use the thiazol in Jones. This patient, ultimately after a period of six months, we were able to cut down the glibetamide dosage to 2.5 mg twice a day. The next group of medications which I'm going to be talking about are the gliptins. They have been around for about 16 to 17 years. They are perhaps the safest medications to utilize. They are moderate in potency and they are officially a second line medication after metformin in those who can afford them. Having said that, now we have uh, gliptins which are a little cheaper than what they used to be before. But having said that, once again, they are not extremely powerful. They are nowhere near in terms of potency when compared to sulfonylureas. And perhaps even the SGLT2 inhibitors, which have come into the market more recently, are probably a little more potent than uh, these medications. So when we talk about SGLT2 inhibitors, we need to know a little bit of physiology. This is the incretin concept. It is very interesting to note that when you give glucose intravenously, as opposed to orally, they have a very different effect on the insulin production. The insulin production in the intravenous phase is not as impressive. It's like this. So the first phase is prominent and after that not as prominent. But when you give in uh, glucose in the oral phase, the insulin production is better. And the reason for that is glucose not only stimulates insulin production directly, but when you give it orally, it goes into the intestine and stimulates some cells in the intestine called L cells. And this stimulates, these L cells when stimulated produce a hormone called GLP-1. Not glucagon, but glucagon-like peptide. But I would like to say it's probably anything unlike, it is something unlike glucagon. It has a very different effect. So GLP-1 analogs, uh, GLP-1, I'm sorry, the hormone works on the beta cells and stimulates the beta cells to produce insulin. It also suppresses the glucagon secretion from the pancreas. And you know, the alpha cells produce glucagon, which antagonizes the effect of insulin. And it also slows gastric, slows gastric emptying. And the 
this triple effect is actually very beneficial for the patient. So ideally speaking, if you can give an injectable substance like GLP-1 or a glucagon-like one peptide, you could reduce glucose levels. And that's a different story because we do have those medications now, but they're injectable. So we can utilize uh, a medication. GLP-1 is located on the L cells, and you can see over here on the seminar stain uh, that uh, this fluorescent stain that these are the cells. And just next to these cells are cells which in fact produce an enzyme which destroys the GLP-1 the moment it comes out. So 90% of the GLP-1 is actually destroyed. If we didn't have this enzyme, perhaps we'd all end up being like uh, huge figures like Avatar, uh, wherein uh, the GLP-1 was not. And we'd be constantly hypoglycemic and we'd become really big. So this enzyme, in fact, destroys the GL 90% of the GLP-1. And if you can prevent this destruction or inhibit this enzyme, you have a medication. So that is what the DPP-4 inhibitors are all about. They inhibit this enzyme, preventing the cleaving of uh, the GLP-1 molecule by inhibiting this particular enzyme. So there are a number of medications now which have evolved uh, from this group that is the DPP-4 inhibitors. And they include cetagliptin, uh, which was the first one, and this is the most time-tested one uh, in the market. Vildagliptin, which has to be given twice a day, and the others, which also can be given once a day. The maximum evidence is from the first two medications. There is a fair amount of evidence with saxagliptin and a little less with linagliptin. And then we have this uh, uh, formulation from Korea, which came called tenigliptin, has swept the Indian market because its cost is much less. And it seems to work as well as uh, the other products which have, uh, which are a little bit more expensive. So uh, we need to understand that all these medications are reasonably safe, except Saxa, not that it's unsafe, but it interacts with the CYP system in the liver. And therefore, drug interactions are more common with uh, Saxagliptin, uh, particularly those on heart, uh, highly active antiretroviral uh, medications and uh, certain other medications which in, uh, which interact with the same enzyme system as well. Uh, they are safe. Uh, most of them are safe to use in cardiac failure, except Saxa, where there's a bit of a controversy. Linakiptin can be given in rather unrestricted quantities in more severe renal failure. But remember, DP4 inhibitors are relatively mild to moderate in their potency. 54-year-old electrician with a monthly income of 40,000, living with his wife and two children, has a BMI of 30 kilograms per meter squares, and by Indian standards, that is significantly obese. Currently, uh, on, on glimipride, three milligrams twice a day, and metformin, one gram twice a day. His fasting glucose levels are 180, postprandials are all elevated, and he's been started thereafter on tenigliptin, 20 milligrams once a day, and his glucose values have come down. Now, if he was affordable and he was only on metformin, a gliptin would have been my second drug of choice in this patient. But now, since the SCLT2 inhibitors have come into place, we'll talk about them, that could be an important second-line medication in those who are obese. Then we have a group of medications called the glynides. Uh, these medications came into the market once again in the early 2000s. Uh, we have repiglinide and nataglinide, which are available. And what is special about this? These medications also work on the beta cell membrane. But the beta cell membrane, when it was created, had a receptor called sulfonylurea receptor, wherein the sulfonylurea actually bind onto this particular receptor and induce this potassium efflux calcium influx and stimulate the beta cell production of insulin. But what these medications do, the uh, glynides, they work on the potassium channel directly. So they work quicker. So they bind faster. So the advantage of this is that sulfonylureas ideally need to be given about 10 to 15 minutes before a meal. Over here, uh, if you're a busy person, as most of you are, when you take a glynide, it works immediately, binds straight onto the 
beta cell membrane. And if you forget to take your medications before the meal, you can always take this after the meal as well. Not only does it bind faster, it also releases faster. Because it releases faster, the amount of insulin product produced is not that great. So they are not as powerful as sulfonyl ureas. And you need to give them, therefore, with every meal. They are short acting and they are relatively weaker medications. Now, when you have a person who's on sulfonyl ureas who's having recurrent hypos, this could be the replacement. If the creatinine is rising, going up to more than 2.5 or 3, you can still use uh, repeglinide in these, in these patients, especially if they are not keen on taking insulin. Patients taking low-dose sulfonyl who encounter problems with hypoglycemia, you can use these medications. Now, type 2 diabetes, I said the foundation is a regular meal pattern, a strict meal pattern, and a good exercise pattern. And that has to be the foundation. Now, in spite of all this, there are groups of people who do not follow uh, these practices. And these include policemen, politicians, and maybe some others you can think about. But when you have uh, religious fasts, which people need to follow, like, for example, prolonged religious fast, like as in Ramzan, where people fast entirely through the day for almost 39 days. In that kind of a situation, uh, you could use these medications. Uh, one of the other tricks that you can do in these diurnal fast where you uh, stay up at night and have your major meals at night is switch the medication pattern. If your major medication during the day is in the morning, you switch it to start in at night. For example, if it's glibenclamide 7.5 mg with breakfast, you change it to glibenclamide 7.5 mg at night. But remember, these medications can work for more than 12 hours. So there, therein lies the advantage of using medications like this. But having said that, even pioglitazone can be used in religious fasts, and so also metformin, provided you don't have gastritis. So the disadvantage is it works mainly in mild hyperglycemia. It does not have a major role when you have someone sitting at the fasting glucose of 300 and a postprandial of 400 when they come to you, or even maybe even less than that. It's not that effective in controlling the fasting glucose levels. It's largely on the postprandial glucose levels. They are first-line drugs with little adjuvant potential. So remember the dose ranges. They are not that cheap, though. Uh, 0.5 milligrams up to 4 milligram with every meal. Natoglinide 60 mg up to 120 milligram. And natoglinide, along with saxagliptin now, and perhaps with metformin, are one of the few uh, the few medications which are which can be given in uh, chronic liver disease uh, freely. 57-year-old man, known to be a reformed alcoholic, having chronic liver disease, recently diagnosed to have diabetes, fasting of 130, uh, uh, post prandial of 210, and his A1C was around 8.9. He wants an oral medication. Which can you suggest? Now, remember, one of the important things in liver disease is because the glycogen storage in the liver is reduced. They have depleted glycogen in the liver. So the storage of potential releasable glucose is less. So any medication you give to these patients can be in a much lower dose. They're very sensitive. And we don't aim at very tight control once you have uh, a child C chronic liver disease. So metformin or natoglinide would be my choices in this kind of a situation. OK, the next group of drugs are the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. So they work on the brush border of the intestine and they cause carbohydrate malabsorption. Once again, they are short acting. So they will not have a major effect on the fasting glucose levels. They're selective for postprandial hyperglycemia and no hypoglycemic symptoms. What, you know, uh, once again, it's interesting in the pharmaceutical world, people will tell you about how important postprandial hypoglycemia is in Indians because we eat a lot of carbohydrates. Unfortunately, there is no evidence to say that postprandial hyperglycemia is much more of a problem. And so it's all kind of hearsay that these medications would work better over there. Now, they, because of the, they're working on the brush, brush border, they have certain disadvantages because uh, they cause a malabsorption of glucose and the bacteria can act on this. And this obviously can cause a lot of abdominal distension and platus. Uh, Acarbose 
was the traditional medication. Of course, now Voglibos is a bit more popular because the amount of GI disturbance is less. And obviously, they are contraindicated in these conditions wherein inflammatory bowel disease, chronic diarrhea, uh, and other intestinal problems, they should not be used. They also tend to accumulate, the, the breakdown products tend to accumulate in renal disease. And that's why we should not be using them in patients who have creatinines more than 1.5. Okay, so we we'll go on next to the kidney as a target. And we all know that uh, once the glucose levels go beyond a certain level, uh, that it's, that you have a glycosuria which ensues. Now, if you can reduce this glycosuria, you can potentially uh, have some better control of glucose. And through direct mechanisms on the proximal renal tubule, which is the area which is responsible for this glucose being put out, you can have an improvement in glucose levels. So these are the STLT2 inhibitors. Now let's also remember that the proximal renal tubule is not only responsible for putting out glucose, but it also puts out electrolytes like potassium, a little bit of sodium, and also amino acids and bicarbonate. So uh, a dysfunction of the proximal renal tubule can cause a proximal renal tubular acidosis. Now this is presumably not a common issue because these are more selective in having, these medications are selective in working on the glucose excretion per se. But let's keep that at the back of our minds. Now, the benefits of the SGLT2 inhibitors is that insulin sensitivity improves. That's great. And indirectly, the GLP secretion also is increased. GLP-1 secretion is increased. Weight reduction occurs. Blood pressure lowering occurs. And there is a cardiovascular benefit, uh, which also occurs in addition, with or without cardiac failure. So this, these are the SGLT2 inhibitors, and they work in this manner and you can highlight these effects which are actually all very well very good these are the classes of medications now available in the market uh, the, uh, rather the groups of medications available in the market uh, the multinational dapa gliflozin canagliflozin empa and it's been shown particularly in the empiric study that cardiovascular events in this particular study are reduced uh, and deaths due to cardiovascular events have been reduced in addition. These are phase 3b studies and we it looks promising, they look very good and therefore they do have a role in cardiac failure. I think that the real truth will be known after a long follow-up in a phase 4 study 10 years from now but we, they do all seem extremely promising in cardiac disease as well. Demogloflozin has come into the Indian market and is uh, relatively cheap. And I do believe now that there are formulations of dapagliflozin, which uh, are also generics, which may be cheaper as well. So what has been shown in addition, that there's a reduction in albuminuria. So when you have patients with uh, microalbuminuria and diabetes, these medications have a role. And even when they have macroproteinuria, these medications may have a role. Uh, there's a reduction in cardiac failure with dapagliflozin in particular. And combining these medications with, uh, with diuretics may obviously have a beneficial effect. Now, the potential adverse effects, and the one at the top is, of course, the most uh, the one which is most uh, disturbing. Uh, genital fungal infections have been reported in women in up to 5 to 10 percent of situations. If you have had a previous urinary tract infection or recurrent urinary tract infection, we would prefer not to use. Urinary tract, uh, you, you prefer not to use STLT2 inhibitors. Elderly patients may complain of polyuria because you are in, increasing the amount of glucose excreted by the kidney. So you can have uh, a mild osmotic diuresis. And in sick patients, you could have potentiation of electrolyte disturbances. So you need to be careful there. There have been some reported cases of osteoporosis, but once again, this is more a smaller number in a big analysis. You should not use it in grossly insulinopenic patients. So if you have someone who's had previous ketoacidosis, it could become a problem if you're using uh, these medications. 
So when you're using SGLT2 inhibitors, we need to know who to prescribe them. In. Yes, they have a role in the obese diabetic patient. And so they have become perhaps an important second or third line drug in treating type 2 diabetes in those patients. We should not use them in those who have immunosuppression, ketoacidosis, type 1 diabetes, by and large, polycystic kidney disease, and those with a risk for gentle infections. Uh, we should always make sure that our patients are well hydrated. So there have been some anecdotal studies which have shown that worsening of gangrene may in fact occur in anecdotal cases. Now let's not get too worried there, but make sure that all your patients who are on SGLT2 inhibitors are also adequately hydrated at the same time. So 60 year old man with a history of diabetes of 60 year duration. He is a politician currently in the legislature. He presents with a history of angina class two, left ventricular failure with an ejection fraction of 44%. Is waiting for the pandemic to get over prior to a coronary procedure. BMI is 33 kg per, per meter squared. He's currently on metformin one gram twice a day. Glycolyzide 160, 120, almost the, the maximal dose. On medications for ischemic heart disease, and his creatinine is 1.5, fasting glucose 160, postprandial 240, A1C 8.2. So he's seen by the local physician and started on pyoglitazone once a day and then referred to you. So if you remember what I said about 15 minutes back, he's probably not a good choice to be on pyoglitazone. So if he saw one of us, we would stop the pyoglitazone and start maybe dapagliflozin because this has been shown in borderline renal function when your creatinine clear, your, uh, your GFR is more than 45, it's safe to use and may be beneficial for these patients. He's obese, so I'm introducing an injectable medication here because he's, he can afford it. Liraglutide plus that tapagliflozin. Liraglutide is a GLP-1 analog, can reduce weight, is safe to use in cardiac failure, in mild renal failure, and also uh, may potentiate his glucose control. Then something happens, he loses the election and he cannot afford his medications anymore. Uh, he, so we continue metformin, stop glycolyzide and replace it with dapagliflozin. Replace the dapagliflozin with remigliflozin and we stop uh, liraglutide as well. Meanwhile, his creatinine has gone to more than 2.5 and so his glucose is easier to control. But because the creatinine has gone up, the GFR has dropped below uh, 30, 30, we will also stop the SGLT2 inhibitors. So remember, it's a very dynamic process when you're treating type 2 diabetes, especially when you reach uh, renal failure. Things can stay static, but they can also progress very fast. So you need to monitor these patients and make medication changes also uh, very quickly. Okay, so we have covered all the large classes till now, but I know that people still use these medications and we hear about them in the armamentarium and therefore, what about them? So, bromocryptine, we used to use a lot of bromocryptine before for treating hyperprolactinemia and then gabagolin came along and we stopped using bromocryptine. But bromocryptine has a central action and remember, it, you know, that stress, I get asked this question and it has been shown. There's this phenomena called allostatic load. You can take it in your patient's history. If someone has a major academic failure or has a death in the family or there's a divorce or is having massive sleep disturbances extra, it can add to the allostatic load and stress can be a frustrating factor for type 2 diabetes or even a worsening factor. Very important to take in this, uh, these factors in, when you're treating these patients. Now, talking about stress hormones, dopamine works centrally and helps in improving dopaminergic activity, which may reset neuroendocrine control and can improve even beta cell function to some extent. So bromocryptine has been shown to be helpful, but the number of studies using bromocryptine for treating two type 2 diabetes is very limited. And the dosage which is recommended is also very small, 0.8 milligram once a day. 
remember the doses used for treating hyperprolactemia are 2.5 and sometimes much more for macroprolactinomas. Common adverse effects, yes, postural dizziness and in type 2 diabetes with autonomic dysfunction, this is more common. Can be used with any drug combination, has been approved by the FDA and the Drug Controller General of India. But there is no long term data available. And personally, I don't use it. But um, there is very little clinical evidence in combination studies with Domacruti. This was a very exciting development about five or six years ago. Uh, and of course, the data actually extends to almost 20 years ago when they saw that patients who, were, who had rheumatoid on hydroxychloroquine were less likely to develop diabetes if they happen to be on hydroxychloroquine at the same time. And we do know that hydroxychloroquine in association with malaria, uh, there are these episodes of hypoglycemia which have been reported time and again. Of course, severe malaria by itself can cause spontaneous hypoglycemia. But this study which was done a while ago had actually shown that the insulin requirements uh, with patients on hydroxychloroquine came down significantly. Now, the concern about uh, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is this bullseye maculopathy. And it's been shown to be much less with hydroxychloroquine. Now, there are Indian studies which were done about five or six years back, which have shown that hydroxychloroquine helps in improving glycemic control as a third line medication. But now, since the armamentarium has increased and you have the SGLT2 inhibitors also in the market, the price of DPP4 inhibitors has decreased. Hydroxychloroquine is essentially not that cheap a medication as such. So its usage has been very limited. This is the recommended dose, 400 milligram once a day or twice a day. But I'd be very cautious in using it even in patients who have mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. I need to keep worrying about whether there can be some synergism and whether uh, these problems in the retina could also occur. So in our practice, we've used it uh, maybe about two or three years ago, we're using it less and less at the moment, but it's still approved by the Drug Controller General of India, not by the FDA for treating type 2 diabetes. But remember, the FDA has also made its mistakes in the past, and they are not, uh, you know, uh, provided with the armor of God as well in handling diabetes. So let's summarize now, and we look at some useful determinants for oral anti-diabetic usage. If you have someone who is, by Indian definition, overweight, BMI more than 22.5 or 23, metformin is obviously good, STLT2 inhibitors, and leptins. If you have someone with mild hyperglycemia and you want to use a single agent, metformin, glynates, well, romacryptine, presence of GI symptoms, which are disturbing, Metformin, un unfortunately, would go off the list if it's a persistent problem. And then you would start using uh, sulfonylureas, gliptins, glitazone, spiglitazone, and the STLT2 inhibitors. If you have renal dysfunction and you must know which creatinine cutoffs to observe, gliptins can be used uh, till the GFR is less than 30. If uh, glitazones can be used up to a creatinine of 4, but we seldom do that because remember, glitazones can cause edema. Glitazones can cause volume overload if you have a cardiac problem. And many patients with renal problems do have a cardiac problem. So we generally refrain. Unless this is a non-nephrotic decline in creatinine and there's no volume overload, it's only a tubular dysfunction, then you could use uh, glitazones. Sulfonylureas, of course, depending on the creatinine cutoff. In the elderly, Repiglinide is a very useful medication and the gliptins can be used safely. Hepatic dysfunction, natriglinide and saxagliptin and metformin as well. And when you're talking about compliance, you're talking about single daily dosing. So the gliptins like cetagliptin, tenigliptin, glitazones like pyglitazone and STLT2 inhibitors are important. And then of course, the bottom line is really important. Can they afford it? The economy. The cheaper medications are metformin, sulfonylureas, glibitlamide is 
the world's cheapest medication almost in any country and biglitazone in India. So this in short would be the way you'd approach your patients. You'd probably have assimilated this into your minds before I actually gave you the, uh, the table, but this is how we would utilize uh, medications in your patients. So let's end with a few clinical problems and then we can have questions from your side. 78 year old Mr. X stays alone, has type 2 diabetes of 8 years duration. His glucose levels on glibentolamide 2.5 mg once a day are uh, good. A1C of 7.6. And remember, as you become more senior and you cross the age of 65 or 70, the A1C cutoffs are different. You don't need to have an A1C of 6.5 once you have crossed 60. You can be a bit more relaxed. And there are good cardiovascular studies which have shown that it's not beneficial to have very low glucose values or A1C values. So his A1C target may be around between 7 and 7.5. But he does complain of hypoglycemia three times a week. And remember, this can be dangerous. His weight is stable. What change will you suggest? So your choice may not be my choice. Great minds don't think alike all, all the time. You can replace glibentlamide with cetagliptin or tenagliptin. You can replace glibentlamide with zepaglinide or nataglinide. So those are the potential choices which we have over here. I certainly would not use pyoglitazone in a 78 year old at the first shot for all the reasons which you know. 45 year old lady has long standing diabetes. Diagnosed to have diabetic nephropathy, creatinine of 2, has significant proteinuria, EGFR of 48 ml per minute, BMI 31 kg per meter squared, does not want to take insulin. I tried very hard with my educators. I think the default rate once we get our educators to talk to our patients is only about 5% and she happens to be in that 5%. What will you suggest for this patient? Okay, gliptins can be used here. Remember, till a GFR are as low as 30. Cetagliptin, dinagliptin, they say you can close your eyes and use it. Repiglinide or nataglinide, or maybe even SGLT2 inhibitors. Remember, the cutoff for SGLT2 inhibitors goes down to 30, but you need to be cautious because if you use it in more severe renal failure, you can cause, you can, you, in fact, because of this osmotic diuresis effect, you can actually have worsening of renal function in such situations. You need to be very cautious in utilizing it once the GFR is below 45. I would personally not use SDLT2 inhibitors. Okay. 38 year old male patient, his BMI is 21.5. I'd probably like to ask you the question at this time. When do you say this is, well, this is a whole different topic which also needs to be covered. How do you know this is type 2 diabetes? Good question. I mean, this patient is not obese by any stretch of imagination. This is the kind of BMI I would like to have. And what would you think about? Well, in rural areas in India, you do have people like this. And if you really want to be puritanical, their C-peptide levels would be mildly elevated, which means they have insulin resistance. They may have some acanthus and nigricans. So what would you suggest after diet and exercise in this patient? Would you use metformin? And the answer is yes, you could use metformin. You could use metformin provided you monitor the patient's weight. Not everyone loses weight on small doses of metformin. You can say that he's on the leaner side. By definition, he's not malnourished, but he's on the leaner side. You could try out pyoglitazone. Once again, be careful that they don't gain too much weight. Gliptins are safe because this is weight neutral and sulfonylureas are, are all right, provided uh, you don't induce hypoglycemia. 41 year old gentleman, and this is one of the questions which one of the uh, uh, listeners has actually provided with a chronic psychosis and non-compliant with diet and exercise. Has glucose values above the norm is non compliant with diet and exercise and irregular uh, with his diet. <clears throat> Eats any old time, does not exercise. And unfortunately, yes, 
uh, with people with uh, long standing chronic depression psychotic illness, illnesses bipolar conditions there could be obvious issues over here which are going to be difficult to handle so he's on metformin 1 gram twice a day diet we are saying is going to be a, a challenge so what are the next medications that you would like to offer in this patient So his BMI, as I've mentioned over here, is what it is I've mentioned. And yeah. So the options are continue metformin one gram twice a day, and then add tenagliptin 20 mg once a day, and then think about dapagliflozin. And then add on pyotitazone. Can you add on? Can you have four drug medication uh, treatment? So the answer is yes. As I mentioned in the beginning, it is not on the ADA guidelines, the American Diabetes. It is not on the Nice guidelines or British guidelines. But the Korean, there are Korean studies which have shown, and this may be pragmatic at times when it's very difficult to get control. So you can do this, but remember, diet and exercise are foundation. If this patient were to follow diet. You could may be able to even remove two or three of these medications and manage with just metformin in such a situation. So the management of diabetes with oral anti-diabetic agents follow certain principles, but we need to individualize uh, care in most situations, and these could depend on the health of the patient, the other comorbidities, the age, the ethnicity, and economic factors. Thank you for your patient listening, and I'd be happy to answer sir, some questions. I think some have already come through, and Dr. Rina will possibly read them out to us. Uh, if you want any further reading, there's this little book uh, which you can get off Amazon on the net, which might be useful and gives a more detailed uh, discussion on these aspects. And we'd be happy to uh, answer your questions by email in addition. The else from the left. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nihal, I mean, for summarizing such a vast topic so clearly and simply, and for the case discussions to illustrate that. Uh, some of the questions that have come in on the chat box, I think you have already answered during the course of the talk. Uh, I'll go on to a few of the others. One is, when do we consider early initiation of combination therapy of oral, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, when we have patients who have uh, fasting glucose levels which are way out of the range, so you have fastings, particularly when they're more than 160 or 170, and the postprandials are in excess of uh, uh, 300 or 350, uh, and if the patient is symptomatic, feeling unwell, then we can utilize uh, combinations early, like sulfonylureas and metformin at an early point of time. Remember, once again, I mentioned sulfonylureas can bring down the glucose levels quite fast as well. Uh, when you said combination, I'd like to caution you against one thing. We have these combi drugs in the Indian market. And remember, to ideally have a combi drug approved, we need to ensure that, uh, that, that the bioavailability is good. Remember, sulfonylureas need to be given ideally before a meal. 10 minutes before. And metformin has to be given immediately after for the bioavailability. Sulfonylureas for having the coordination on the beta cell and releasing insulin and the absorption of food at the same time is also important. So these combi drugs, which the Indian market provides, are actually unscientific in many ways because uh, you have to give a sulfonylurea before and metformin after a meal. I know they're practical, uh, especially in primary care when your patients are like to take one medication and you're talking about compliance, they're practical. But when you look at bioavailability and efficacy, they are not as good. And also to increase the drugs, once you're on a particular medication, gradually increasing the medication, you will invariably increase both medications and you cannot control uh, your medication, uh, uh, your medication uh, dispensation in that sense. Thank you. Uh 
uh, that question was also there, and you've addressed that. Uh, this may be a bit of a repeat, but I will ask it again. What would be the order of preference in a lean diabetic? Yeah. So now, when you say lean diabetic, when you say classically lean means malnourished. That means a BMI less than 18.5. And I'd like to say that a BMI less than 18.5 means this is not type 2 diabetes. We're dealing with something else. So that's the authentic uh, WHO definition of malnourished state when you say lean. Uh, so that is what, that's not not type 2 diabetes. Someone with a BMI less than 18.5, we have to think of other differential diagnoses which go beyond the scope of this lecture. Type 1 diabetes, malnutrition modulated diabetes, lipodystrophy, other things which are totally different group. So I presume what you're saying here is someone with a BMI in the range of say 20 to around 23 with an optimal BMI kind of thingy. So that situation, uh, like I said, you can use metformin very carefully. It's not contraindicated. You're sure it's type two, you can use metformin. You can use pyoglitazone, especially with the BMIs in 2021. You can safely use because you're not worried about a bit of weight gain over there. Uh, so these are the two medications which we use. Sulfonylurea is also because you're, you, you will not cause weight loss. Sulfonylurea by stimulating insulin production can actually cause a bit of weight gain, a little bit. And so you can use sulfonylureas over there and lean people as well. And yes, if it's very mild and they can afford it, you can use the glinides like repeglinide or natiglinide in these people. Uh, someone has asked, do oral anti-diabetic drugs have an effect on appetite? Yes. yes. Uh, so oral anti-diabetic drug medications do have an effect on appetite. Metformin can, by one of its mechanisms of reducing weight, actually do reduce appetite. Uh, medications which stimulate insulin production like sulfonylureas can increase appetite. Remember, insulin can cause hypoglycemia and therefore in appetite gain is there. After the age of utilizing now continuous glucose monitoring systems, which is now part of our practice in routine use as well, uh, we start picking a lot of hypoglycemia, which may be nocturnal in particular. And uh, yes, it uh, can stimulate appetite in those situations. Which would you recommend? I'm so sorry. Sorry, of all the glyptins, which would you recommend? Okay. okay. Uh, I get some questions like this because it might make people think that I have an inclination towards a particular product or a manufacturer. So let me put the cards on the table and say Cetagliptin has been the longest in the market. There's maximal data available uh, as well. And that's why Cetagliptin, eyes closed, if you can afford it, is the best medication for, for a long period of time. Comparatively between gliptins, as far as efficacy, there's very little to show. It's interesting. There is once, wildergliptin has to be given twice a day. That's why it's not my go-to medication when it comes to gliptins. So, and also there is one study in diabetes care about seven years back, which showed that wildergliptin was very weak and was was uh, was equivalent to placebo. Uh, there was one study like that. So that's why wilda is not in my queue of medications for gliptins. Saxa has drug interactions. So I would not use that. Uh, Linagliptin, the amount of evidence is less. Teniligliptin, also the evidence is less, but it's cheap and it's safe. It does work. Linagliptin also works. So they're all kind of the same. But when we talk about evidence with volumes of data, cetagliptin is up there. Um, there's a question on what is the association between depression and diabetes mellitus? This is from my classmate Sudhi Charles. Is there a role of routine low-dose antidepressants if clinically indicated? Yeah, so, yeah. so that's a very important question. Depression has to be addressed when you have type 2 diabetes. It's going to be difficult to control your sugars if you have depression. Uh, I think there is a significant amount of horm hormonal interplay when you have depression. And if you don't treat it adequately, glucose levels 
may be more difficult to control. You may end up giving much more medications than what, what you needed to have given. So giving antidepressants when it's clinically indicated is important and can make diabetes control much easier. That is absolutely true. And it becomes, when you're, you have underlying depression, there can be problems with dietary control, which is once again the foundation. So uh, overeating, binge eating, uh, food preferences extra become much more a problem once you have a depressed state. The motivation to exercise will be less. So yes, treating it will be directly and indirectly very good for the patient with type 2 diabetes. Um, so which antidepressants would you advise or advise against in, say, an obese patient with diabetes and depression? So again, it's a theory of, of uh, activity over here. Uh, I, I think this applies more to the antipsychotic medications which you're talking about. Uh, the older antipsychotics like clopromazine, which are cheaper, obviously, uh, olanzapine is definitely much more glucotoxic in its. Uh, so, what has been shown is that olanzapine is much more. Not that presperidone and all do not cause this tendency for worsening of hyperglycemia, but aripiprazole is supposed to be safer when compared to the other uh, antipsychotic medications which are used. Uh, having said that, uh, whenever we have medications which are attributable towards a negative effect, on a particular disease, we have to be extremely careful because as physicians, sometimes we try to swear and say that this may be causing that. For example, I'll give you another example. Thiazides are known to worsen hyperglycemia in a small subset, but thiazides are the second best medication for controlling, cheapest medication and second best medication for controlling blood pressure in patients who have diabetes. So we cannot say that Thiazides are contraindicated in patients who have diabetes. The same goes for antipsychotics. The psychiatrist may have a choice. The patient may have done extremely well. So we have to always be sure that it is the medication which is causing the problem rather than withdrawing it and then having a relapse or worsening in this patient's uh, psychiatric condition in addition. Is met metformin approved for use in gestational diabetes? So this is a whole ball game by itself. Uh, I'll give a very brief answer to that uh, because I think GDM has to be discussed and we can have a lecture on that at some point of time. But metformin is categorized as a B category medication in, 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 in pregnancy and gestational diabetes. Uh, it has been shown to be effective in gestational diabetes. So when I say gestational diabetes, we talk about after the OGD done in the second trimester, we utilize metformin in these patients. We can introduce it. It is safe. Uh, it has been, it is not approved by the ADA. It's interesting, but it is approved by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. So the two august bodies in the United States have different opinions about it. The ADA will tell you, you must use insulin as first drug of choice. Now, if we are going to be doing that. We'd have a major health crisis if we were try, trying to use insulin in all our patients who had BDM. It's not practically possible. We use diet and exercise very effectively in about 75% of patients who have GDM with mild GDM. And the next drug, practically speaking, is metformin. It's safe. It's effective. There are some interesting studies looking at the body composition of the babies after two years and nine years. and But what they exactly mean that the subcutaneous fat increases after nine years in the child. I'm not sure. I think we're doing a lot of good by controlling the glucose with metformin. We're preventing a lot of big babies. Um, we're inducing good glycemic control. So metformin is first, and insulin is the second drug that we utilize in pregnancy. There are studies on glibenclamide and gestational diabetes before the metformin medications were, were shown to be effective. Uh, glibenclamide used to work, but we know now that um, the hypoglycemic effects, the effect on the fetus, in fact, there are studies done by CMC Velo by uh, Gigi and our team along with collaboration with us on comparing metformin versus glibenclamide. We don't use it anymore in pregnancy. Uh, remember, I'm talking about gestation. I'm not talking about pre-gestation or first trimester. Having said that, metformin 
when used in infertile ladies or patients with PCOS having continued through the first trimester of pregnancy, I don't withdraw it because I think it has had a good effect and it is controlling the glucose levels. There are studies by, done, done by a reproductive medicine unit uh, about a decade and a half back, which have shown that metformin when continued into pregnancy in infertile women has been safe and efficacious. That's the story. A couple more questions on metformin. I will uh, read them both. Does chronic metformin use cause B12 deficiency? And what can be done to reduce GI intolerance in patients on metformin? Yeah. So, once again, excellent question. B12, the B12 that is quoted in about 2%, maybe a little higher in those who have, are vegetarians. What can you do to prevent it? Actually speaking, not too much. Uh, I mean, you're not going to have a major dietary change if you're a vegetarian and change to something else. So the issue is to try and identify it when it occurs. Suppose your patient is showing trends of unexplained tiredness, macrocytosis on the blood picture, even without, even before they develop anemia, anemia which is unexplained, worsening peripheral neuropathy, weight loss, which is unexplained, lack of appetite. These are all various symptoms which could be due to B12 deficiency. We need to identify it and then subsequently treat appropriately. So we should measure the B12 levels in that situation. I'm not recommending checking B12 levels routinely in every patient who's on metformin. But yes, the indication is higher if a patient has a largely vegetarian diet. And when it does occur, when it does occur and when it's due to management of diabetes, better to supplement the B12 rather than stop metformin altogether. Um, the other question on metformin was what can be done to reduce the GI intolerance in patients on metformin? Okay, so when we're talking about GI intolerance, you're talking about upper GI intolerance and you're talking about lower GI intolerance. With low GI intolerance, as I mentioned, uh, the diarrhea usually tapers off in a couple of weeks' time, and a small proportion, about 5%, may have some low GI irritability. Some people can tolerate it. They continue. Some Those who cannot, obviously, you need to reduce the dosage. So some sometimes it happens once the dose goes up to about 1 gram. And then you can reduce the dosage to 500 mg twice a day, and then the symptoms disappear. But some people, even on smaller doses, cannot tolerate it and you have to stop the medication. I don't think there's anything specific you can do to reduce the low GI intolerance. And even the upper GI intolerance, yes, you can add proton pump inhibitors extra if you want to. Uh, so that may be one strategy. But sometimes, in despite that, uh, they continue to have uh, upper GI intolerance and you may have to stop the medication. Uh, there is a question on a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome, depression, a BMI of 31 on metformin 500 mg BD. Uh, what would you suggest? I, I assume the sugars are still high. Huh? Yeah. Well, I, I, the question could also mean that someone is using metformin for weight reduction. Metformin is a very cheap medication which can be used for attempting weight reduction. Uh, so it may be there and you can go up to one gram twice a day if you want to try it out. It works in a small proportion. Uh, there are studies both ways. There are studies which have shown that metformin plus diet and exercise help a little bit but not much more. There are other studies which show that metformin is actually very effective in reducing weights anywhere from two to five kilograms when utilizing it along with diet and exercise. Uh, so it could mean continuing that. Uh, metformin may have some effect in uh, normalizing uh, menstrual cycles in a proportion of patients with polycystic ovarian disease. So it can be continued in that situation as well. Regarding the depression, uh, I hope the B12 levels have been checked and the patient does not have B12 deficiency induced uh, depression. I guess that is probably what it meant. Now the last question, as we are nearing the end of our time, uh, the mechanism of edema and aggravation of orbitopathy by pyoglitazone. 
So, so basically, you have aggravation. Uh, remember, remember there's an immunological mechanism in which uh, uh, orbitopathy actually occurs, and you have infiltration of the muscles. So pyglitazone may in fact aggravate this infiltration, may also cause fat deposits in addition to what happens in the muscle, fat deposits within the orb orbit as well. Uh, and uh, so this may become progressive and actually worsen thyroid orbitopathy. And sometimes this may be very difficult to reverse even after stopping pyglitazone. So by and large, if you have a uh, significant Graves disease with even mild proptosis, avoid pyglitazone. So this does not mean that patients with uh, mild eye signs like lid retraction or lid lag, that we should be stopping pyglitazone in those situations. So thank you again, Dr. Nihal, for a very informative and wide-ranging talk. Thank you all for tuning in. Our next CME will be two weeks from now, and we will be looking at the chest X-ray, the good, the bad, and the deadly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.